I wrote ankle instability. Lateral ligaments are most commonly injured uh, ligaments in the body, accounting for up to 20% of all sports injuries. It's the second most common injury in the NFL. It accounts for almost half of all basketball and 20% of soccer injuries. In this country alone, there's 27,000 ankle sprains every single day. And there's up to 8,000 hospitalizations per year due in some form at, due to some form of lateral ankle instability. And, and up to half of these will occur at the time of some sporting activity. Now, Paul Galano has demonstrated beautifully both the ATFL and CFL ligaments, which compose of the lateral ligament complex. Uh, predominantly, the ATFL is injured alone, um, or indeed with the CFL less frequently. The CFL in isolation is rarely injured. Following a typical ankle sprain, up to 70% of patients uh, will experience a subsequent ankle sprain if not treated with the appropriate triple phase rehab. So therefore, the primary risk factor of an ankle sprain is a previous ankle sprain. Chronic lateral ankle instability is defined as the condition resulting from a lateral ankle sprain with greater than 12 months of residual symptoms or giving way or indeed subjective functional instability. Why do we care about this? Well, 20% of ankle sprains result in chronic lateral ankle instability despite appropriate therapy. And more than half of the patients who, st who sustain recurrent ankle sprains report long-term disability. It's interesting that up to 50 to 100% of patients who have chronic lateral ankle instability will have some form of concomitant pathological lesion. And these include perineal tendon problems, sinusitis, and cartilage, cartilage injuries, including osteochondral lesions. It must be remembered that the ATFL and lateral ligaments are the primary static ankle stabilizers, and the dynamic stabilizers are the perineal tendons. So if the ATFL is torn or attenuated, the perineal tendons therefore have to do more work. Over time, they become hypertrophic, and then they may become inflamed, stenotic, and ultimately tear. So it is incumbent upon us always uh, to look at perineal tendon pathology at the same time somebody has a chronic ATFL injury. There's some very nice work uh, done by Bischoff and Nunley has shown that the in 3D um, models with biplanar fluoroscopy that the lateral ankle instability increases anteromedial peak cartilage pressures. So oftentimes when we find somebody has anteromedial impingement or indeed an anteromedial osteochondral lesion, uh, they'll have a concomitant chronic lateral ankle instability. The mechanism of injury is important in disaster to the board exams typically due to an excessive inversion and plantar flexion type injury. With uh, ankle plantar flexion, the ATFL is uh, strained initially, and then the CFL. Typically, ankle dorsiflexion and inversion injury is the mechanism of injury of the CFL. When the ankle is dorsiflexed, externally rotated, the injury typically involves the syndesmosis, or an upper ankle sprain, and this is discussed in a separate uh, lecture. Clinical examination is difficult in the initial period as the patient is uh, painful and tender. But after four to five days, uh, we can do the, an anterolateral glide uh, with the foot in slight internal rotation, removing the uh, force of the deltoid. Anterior drawer is probably the most useful, as is a tailor tilt and varus and valgus stress by comparison to the contralateral side. The stress x-ray is of marginal value unless it is being used with a standard TLOS device, as the strength of each surgeon or each examiner will vary. Care has to be given always to evaluate the contralateral side and to determine whether or not the patient has any collagen laxity or generalized ligamentous laxity that may account uh, for the ATFL attenuation 
or the greater range of motion that has been evaluated. Patients with cave of varus type feet are more prone uh, to mechanical overloading of the ATFL, and so that, therefore uh, this must be carefully evaluated. Now the various classifications of injury, this one is simply uh, probably the easiest to remember. A great one is a stretching injury without any microscopic tear, with mild swelling, tenderness, and minimal, minimal difficulty um, in terms of range of motion. And those patients typically walk in uh, to the clinic. Grade 2 is a true tear of the ATFL, accompanied by a partial or complete tear of the CFL. It may have moderate swelling, ecchymosis, and anterolateral tenderness with restriction of motion. Grade 3 is a tear of the ATFL, CFL, and PTFL. Again, diffuse swelling, ecchymosis, and tenderness. And oftentimes, these patients come in with an inability to work bear weight. Now, triple phase rehab program is the uh, standard of care when patients come in, so early mobilization in contrast to the previous uh, ways that we used to immobilize these patients right away, we now start moving them as soon as they're able to tolerate this. Acute phase is rice, functional bracing, weight bearing is tolerated, and crutches when needed. Physical therapy concentrates in restoring motion, strengthening balance and proprioception. Balance and proprioception are the key to this, not just in terms of mechanical stability, but in functional stability. Mike Freeman, Mike Freeman first described functional stability in the early 1960s as the ability of the body to know where the ankle is in space. You may be mechanically stable, but functionally unstable, and therefore this is a learned response, which physical therapy that can train in terms of balance and proprioception. Surgical indications are important. As we have alluded to, 20 to 40 percent of patients may have an instability after conservative treatment. And of those, the vast majority of them will have likelihood of re-injury. Therefore, we must consider surgical management for grade 3 injuries. In a recent study, in a randomized control trial for surgical repair, suture repair of the ligaments one week post injury versus conservative management. At a 14 year follow up, prevalence of re injury was just 7% in the surgical treated group versus 38% in those treated with convert conservative triple phase rehab. Surgical procedures, therefore, for acute or indeed chronic lateral ankle instability are non anatomic uh, reconstruction and anatomic reconstruction of procedures. The non-anatomic reconstruction include check rein procedures, such as the Watson-Jones, Christmas Snook, and Evans. These are perhaps more historical or a bailite type procedure and are rarely performed. Anatomic procedures include direct repair and indeed reconstruction of the ATFL and CFL. Non-anatomic reconstruction involves a tenodesis of the adjacent peroneus brevis, used for poor quality ATFL remnant, and various surgical techniques have been advocated. The disadvantage of non-anatomic reconstruction is that it does change the kinematics, leading oftentimes to posterior facet arthrosis of the subtalar joint. There's a higher risk of wound complications and a higher risk of nerve damage. And because the primary dynamic stabilizer, the perineus brevis, is being used, there's also eversion weakness. Therefore, again, this is rarely used as a primary indicator any longer in ATFL insufficiency. Now, the anatomic procedures depend on whether there is sufficient ATFL remnant or sufficient ATFL remnant. This can be evaluated either on MRI or on arthroscopic evaluation. A direct ATFL repair can be done through an open procedure or an arthroscopic procedure. When an insufficient ATFL remnant is available, an anatomic reconstruction using a graft is required. Now the gold standard is the anatomic direct repair. This is known as a Brostrom, or modified in the 1980s by Gould, to the Brostrom Gould. The Gould modification is the extensive retinaculum being attached to the distal fibula, 
once the repair of the ATM file has been performed. This can be done either through open or arthroscopic procedures, but it does require good quality ATF file. It is low cost, relatively simple, minimally invasive, with low complications and long term outcomes are excellent. The clinical outcomes of the Brostrom Gould or ATF file repair show that the short term outcome, majority of patients achieve good to excellent results. The long term outcome, greater than 10 years, by these various studies, all show greater than 90% patient satisfaction. In a systematic review of 11 studies of 669 Boston Group procedures, the revision rate was just 1.2% at almost eight and a half years following surgery. This is how the procedure is performed. It's a layered approach, identifying the ATFL remnant and indeed the extensor retinaculum. Suture anchors are incorporated into the anatomic footprint on the fibula. The ATFL is sutured and the perineal sheath is inspected. A layered closure is performed using the extensor retinaculum, which tightens the floor of the perineal sheath or the CFL. Post op re rehabilitation is now advanced two weeks in a bulky dressing with no splint. 10% body weight. At two to four weeks, advancing weight bearing to full weight bearing and beginning formal physical therapy. And four to six weeks, as sports physical therapy is initiated. Six to eight weeks, patients may get back to sports drills. So anytime after eight to 10 weeks, they may get back to their full sporting activities. Anatomic reconstruction using a graft is performed when the ATFL remnant is not sufficient. This can be seen in a previous failed ligament surgery, absent or attenuated remnant, in chronic lateral ankle instability, in patients with generalized ligamentous laxity, and in the typical running back, in the typical a football player weighing over 250 pounds who requires excessive stability of their ankle. Various graft sources are available, including local or free autograft and allograft. Autograft includes local perineal tendon, plantaris, or hamstring. The advantage of this is there's good tissue quality. However, there is donor, some degree of donor site morbidity. Allograft has no donor site morbidity, and shorter operative time. However, there is a risk of a disease transmission, slower biological healing, lower modulus of elasticity and creep over time, higher cost, and there may well be a subclinical immune response. The clinical outcomes of reconstruction and the short-term outcomes, majority of patients achieve good to excellent results. However, no comparative studies exist. But Coughlin, Tsujimoto, and others have shown either with a gracilis, bone patellar, te bone patellar tendon, or perineus longus tendon, the outcomes have been excellent. At long term studies, over 10 years, however, there are no results. But it is unlikely that it will have the same impact on the posterior facet of the subtalar joint as these are not over tightened. This is a typical uh, procedure for harvesting the perineus longus. The graft is harvested from a partial resection of the longus. The remaining of the tendon, over 50% of it, is left in situ. The anatomic footprints of the ATFL, both on the fibula and talus, are carefully identified and drill holes placed. And the graft is fixed into the talus and passed through the fibula and tightened accordingly. In an interesting study by Presque et al., the lateral ligament repair of the hybrid construct, which we have described, was compared uh, both to Brostrom alone and the Brostrom Gould. 
This cadaveric study looked at contact mechanics and hind foot motion patterns, and it was seen that hybrid graft reconstruction using the anatomic footprint that was better than the Bross Malone and indeed best better than the Bross from Gould, indicating that we need to be very careful about the position of our ATFL uh, when we are doing reconstruction or replacement. We must always look for concomitant pathology. We need to check for osteochondral lesions, antromedial impingement or antilateral impingement, particularly with soft tissue impingement on the lateral side from cicatrization over chronic ankle instability. We must always check for perineal pathology. Is there a high correlation between ATFL injury, osteochondral injury, and perineal tendon pathology? Arthroscopic anatomic repair is becoming increasingly popular. It's used for good quality ATF remnant in some uh, patients. Other procedures um, use an extensor retinaculum and a soft tissue plication, which is tr truly not a, a brostrum type procedure, but a soft tissue plication. In these procedures, there's a high complication rate of nerve injury. The expectation is that ultimately arthroscopic anatomic repair will reduce postoperative pain and complications while promoting faster recovery. At this time, that has not been proved conclusively. When we look at the arthroscopic repair and clinical outcomes, in terms of uh, comparative studies, we can see that there are similar results. At one year follow up, the AFOS scores were equivalent. However, there is an increased risk of complications in terms of nerve injury and longer, longer surgical times at this point as it is a learning curve. An interesting study by James Calder in London has identified a need for early arthroscopic, early repair of the ATFL in professional athletes. They performed a brostrum repair for acute grade 3 injuries in 42 athletes. This provided a stable ankle and expected return to sports at 10 weeks. And this will reduce the incidence of repeat sprains. This is certainly changing the dynamic and the paradigm for treating elite athletes with early surgery rather than functional conservative treatment for ATF injuries. Here are some questions. Uh, taken from Ortho Bullets, a 30-year-old high school, correction, a 30-year-old high-level athlete sustained a low ankle grade 1 uh, sprain. The treatment options of immobilization and functional management are discussed. Which of the following statements are false? And functional management is associated with greater risk of increased ankle joint laxity than immobilization. We now know that to be false, although several years ago that was regarded as true. A 21-year-old collegiate basketball player comes down with a rebound and rolls his ankle. He's able to finish the game, but complains of high ankle sprain, correction, complains of an ankle pain and swelling afterwards. Physical exam is notable for moderate inversion laxity with the ankle held in dorsiflexion. In placement of the ankle in plantiflexion, no inversion laxity is appreciated. Which of the following ligaments has been attenuated? And we know the CFL is attenuated when in dorsiflexion. In the majority of patients, which of the following treatments leads to a good or excellent one-year pro prognosis in the care of first-time grade 3 sprains of the lateral ligaments of the ankle? And we have a laundry list um, of all the things that we have discussed previously in, in a conservative therapy. So therefore, all of these are equal. Thank you, and good luck in your exams.